Good morning. How was everybody this morning? Tired? <laughs> All right. Just a few announcements before we get started. Uh, you just saw the trailer for Show Me the Father. That's going to be June 18th. That's a Saturday evening. That's next Saturday evening, I believe. Um, and we're going to be doing worship and doing the movie, hopefully outside, weather permitting. Um, so invite. Invite people to come out. That's a good chance to get people in you know, into the church um, without bringing them to church and then getting to meet some people. Uh, summer camp, um, I'm going to be making sure we get everybody registered this week for um, summer camp for our youth. So if you're able to uh, partial scholarship or do a scholarship, um, see either uh, Pastor Don, Pastor Jeff, or myself, and we'll get you, um, we'll get you in the right direction. Um, you had to put me on the spot, didn't you? It's... It's right after VBS, so it's like the, VBS is July 11th through the 15th, and I think it's like the 16th or 16th or something through the, or 18th, what is it? The 19th? Okay. So that's in July. So um, see us, and we can get you more information on that. Um, VBS, July 11th through the 15th, uh, 6 to 8.30 in the evening. That's for all ages. So um, even as adults, there'll be adult classes. So you can come and be a part of that. Um, if you still want to be a part of helping with that, let me know. You can, you can do both. You know, you can help a little bit and be in class as well. So just see me and we can get you plugged in. Fundamentals of Faith is coming in September. Um, so look, look forward to that. Uh, faith and Finance is coming in September as well. Is that, the, is that from Love, Inc.? Okay, so that's, uh, we did the other class with Love, Inc. This will be, um, be their next class on faith and finance. I just heard, I just talked to someone the other day about it, and they said it's, it's really good. It, it opens your eyes. Um, even if you have been a, belie you know, been a believer or, you know, been good with your finances or think you've been good with your finances, um, you, it enlightens you um, a lot there. So... Uh, loss of a spouse is going to be a one-time event coming in September, um, which that's part leading into grief share. Is that correct? Okay. Um, and then grief share, which is going to be an ongoing class, is going to be beginning in January of 2023. So look forward to that. And um, once we get a date for the September uh, loss of a spouse, we will get that out there as well. And then Monday evenings, ladies, um, we're still finishing up Adorn. Uh, we've got a few more weeks, so um, come on in. It doesn't matter if you've not been here um, from the beginning. You can come in. It's video-driven, so you're not going to um, have missed anything. So we would love to see you uh, Monday evenings at 6.30. It's all you. How you guys doing today? He already knows. He's in, he's in, he's in, all right, yeah. you got to be a regular here. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, up on your feet. It's time to worship. And before we worship, we always start in prayer. Okay, you ready? Father God, we thank you for this day. And we just ask that you would just help us to, to put all of the stuff in our lives that would hinder us from focusing on you, that we would just leave that at the door, God. That you would just help us to be attentive to your word today, God. That you would have your way here, that you would speak to our hearts you would convict us and encourage us and build us up. We pray for the message today that it would be anointed by you. And Father God, I pray that you would help us all to just focus on you during this worship time and that you would receive all the glory and the praise because you are worthy. In Jesus' name.
the wall to be found Are there shackles on your feet that weigh you down? Are you scared? There's no way out Are you sick and tired of falling on the ground? Stand up if you believe in the God of freedom Somebody give him praise Stand up if you believe in the name of Jesus Somebody give him praise Can I get a witness? Can I get an amen? Can I get a glory? Hallelujah Somebody give him praise Can I get a yes, Lord? Can I get a he's so good? Can I get another testimony? Somebody give him praise If your mountains are way too tall If you're up against a giant that won't fall And if you feel impossible Get ready to receive a miracle Can I get a witness? Can I get a name? Can I get a glory? Somebody give him praise. Can I get a yes, Lord? Can I get a he's so good? Can I get another testimony? Somebody give him seated. Turn in your Bibles to John 18. We're going to kind of make our way through the first part of this because I want to give you some context. But before we do, I want to take a few moments and have a Selah. Selah is a term in the Psalms that means to just stop and rest and quiet your minds and be ready to hear from what God wants to say to you. So take the next few minutes in silence and just sit there and ask the Lord to speak to you today. Father, sometimes it's difficult to be quiet. Our life is rush, 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 do, do, do. Our minds are constantly working, and sometimes it takes just a moment of silence to be in your presence and to hear from you. And silence is hard. Our mind wants to fill the space, Lord, and we want to hear from you today. Father, in the midst of the things that are going on in our life, 
from wayward children to the death of a spouse to the declining health of a spouse to the death of a parent to caring for a a loved one. Lord, in the midst of cancer, in the midst of diagnoses that leave us questioning a lot, Father, we just trust you. We need you, Lord. We need you in the midst of all of those things. And we need you to speak to us. So, Father, today we lay our lives before you in humility, in submission. And we ask, Father, that you would speak to us powerfully through your word. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you realize that we've been in the book of John for a year and a month? 13 13 months we've been in this book. We started May 9th, and we started with John 1-1, and we've worked our way all the way up to the end of chapter 18. We're going to be in verses 28 through 40 tonight. But I want to give you some context, because as we preach through this, as Don and I preach through this, sometimes we lose a little bit of context when we just parachute in and pick up a few verses. And we're going to do that today, but I want to give you, I want you to look back over the totality of John 18, because there's some really interesting things to look at here. As we work our way through John 18, I'm in the ESV, and in verses 1 through uh, 11, you'll see a heading that says, the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. So the disciples and Jesus are together in these first 11 verses. But John, being the author that he is, okay, we refer to the first three books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as the synoptic gospels. Synoptic coming from the word synopsis, meaning they're giving you the story of kind of the facts of Jesus' life. They do it from three very different perspectives. Mark is the kind of guy that gets right to the point, gives the details, and moves on. Luke is a doctor. Luke loves to deal with the details and And things about healings really resonate with Luke because he's a doctor. Matthew gives us a a perspective that's specifically for the people to whom he's writing. But John is a literary author, okay? His take on all of this is, I'm going to tell a story. And I'm going to tell a story for a very real purpose, okay? And we'll get to what that purpose is. So John doesn't mind taking a few things and moving the order of some of these things. He doesn't mind doing some things that are literary in nature, and he does that in chapter 18 when he deals with Jesus and the disciples together in these first 11 verses, but then he takes us into what Jesus is facing. In verses 12 through 14, Jesus is before Ananias and and, uh, Annas and Caiaphas. Then he takes us outside of where that's going on inside of the palace, and he takes us over here to what's going on with Peter in verses... 15 through 18, and he talks about what Peter's dealing with outside. Now, at this time, the disciples had dispersed. Judas was gone. Nine of them left, and really only two are present right here. John, who does not even care in his humility to name himself, and Peter. And so John writes about what's going on with Peter while Jesus is facing this. In verses 19 through 24, We go back inside, we see what's going on with Jesus, and then we come back out for a few verses in 25 through 27, and again see Jesus denying Peter. So I want you to see that kind of ping pong that's going on, and then I want you to follow as we go through our time today, in that we go back inside and we see what's going to happen to Jesus as we prepare for his death, burial, and resurrection, okay? But I don't want to go through the verses 28 through 40, I want you to hear it and see it yourself. So 
So Pilate went outside to them and asked, What do you accuse this man of? We would not have brought him to you if he had not committed a crime. Then you yourselves take him and try him according to your own law. We are not allowed to put anyone to death. This happened in order to make come true what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he would die. Pilate went back into the palace and called Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? Does this question come from you? Or have others told you about me? Do you think I'm a Jew? It was your own people and the chief priests who handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish authorities. No. My kingdom does not belong here. Are you a king, then? You say that I am a king. I was born and came into the world for this one purpose. To speak about the truth. Whoever belongs to the truth. I often say that sometimes Hollywood gets it right, okay? Sometimes they don't. Um, I don't recommend the movie Noah, for instance, but in this particular case, the Visual Bible, they really get some things right, and I want to bring your attention to one particular non-spoken word. Non -sp it wasn't a word, but it was a, re a reaction that Caiaphas had when Jesus, when he asked, what is truth? Did you hear him scoff? Did you hear that in his voice just before he said, what is truth? What is Caiaphas? What, in your mind, what is he? Not rhetorical. I want you to answer. Say again. Pilot. Sorry, not Caiaphas. Pilot. Sorry. Thank you. I get words mixed up in my head. So, Pilate, what is, what is he? Yes, sir. He is. Well, no, he's, yeah, he's, he's a proconsul, I believe. But let's, not specifically what, but what is your view of him? What is your view of, of Pilate? Say again. Arrogant, okay. Powerful. Cowardly, oh, okay. Smart. Okay. Interesting. The last thing he said is he saw Jesus for who he was. Anybody else? Any opinion about Pilate? Say again. Unwilling participant. Okay. What I want to point out to you is Pilate... I believe has an overinflated sense of his role in all of this. And it kind of goes against what you said and kind of goes where you went. Because he's not in charge, even though 
the Roman government says he is at this time, but he's really not in charge. God's in charge of all of this, and that's what I want us to focus in on today. As we go through these verses, I want to do what I often do with you, and that is to point out a few of the questions that pop up in my mind as I read, but let's go back and let's look at verses 28 and beyond. In verse 28, it says, they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. Anybody else have a different word in their, in their translation? Anybody reading from NASB or New King James? Praetorium. Okay, praetorium is a very Roman word, okay? And it just means governor's headquarters. So it's, in most translations, they just take the opportunity and translate it for you. But I like the fact that New King James, oddly enough, King James doesn't use praetorium, but New King James does, and NASB does, and, and they kind of use it to emphasize this idea that Rome is in charge, and by proxy, Pilate's kind of in charge, but in reality, Pilate is not in charge in this particular situation. So it says it was early morning. John, Don pointed out last week that this trial that they did took place during the night, and it happened when trials don't normally take place because they were trying to get it done before the Passover began. They're trying to get it done in secret so that they can get their way, the Jews are, but they're doing it illegally, basically. The Jews themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. Now, you have to understand that the Jews wanted to follow the law every jot and tittle of the law, but they had put so many more jots and tittles in the law than God had ever intended. God didn't intend for G Gentiles to be completely shunned, okay? Jesus obviously spent time with people that were not Jewish. He spent time with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. But the Jews had taken this idea of the Gentiles are to be separated from to the point where we they couldn't even go in a gentile's house now i'll get to the pg-13 part of my message here in that they believed mistakenly that the gentiles would often abort or kill their children and then flush them down a drain in the house and that's why they did not want to be in the presence of a dead body so they just avoided all gentile homes okay that was not true. And God didn't intend for them to be that separated. He intended for them to be separate, but not to that extent. They had taken it to a new level. And, they, and in this particular case, they weren't even going to go in the palace with uh, Pilate because they were afraid that they might be defiled and not eat the Passover. Verse 29, so Pilate went outside to them. He comes outside and he says, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answer with a question. Now, I mentioned this on Friday night. If my wife asks me a question and I respond with a question, she immediately knows I'm looking for a way out. She immediately begins to think he's trying to hide something. And the simplest question is, what? And I know I'm in trouble when I say, what? So in this case... Pilate asks them a direct question. They, say, they answer with a question themselves, and they say, if this man were not doing evil, would we have not delivered him over to you? Pilate asks them again. He's, he tells them this time, he says, take him yourself and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Now, the Old Testament did, hang on, the Old Testament did offer opportunities for the death penalty, okay? There are pre precepts of, the, of, hang on, Rishi, I'll get to you. <laughs> there are precepts in the Old Testament for the death penalty. But what was pointed out to me Friday night by one of our scholars in church is that the Romans had taken that away. And it was the Romans that were in charge. Now, the reason why Jesus, we're going to get to this verse about Jesus showing by by showing the kind of death he was going to die by, the idea of Jewish death, Jewish execution, was by stoning. They did it to Stephen in Acts 7. 
They tried to do it to Jesus twice before this, and Jesus kind of walked right through the crowd. A death by stoning would mean that the person would go down, would go face down and be pummeled by rocks. Again, more PG-13 than you were probably expecting to hear. And then they would be pummeled to death. And Jesus specifically had to be what? Lifted up. And that's why the Romans were involved, because that was their form of execution, was for him to be lifted up. Yes, sir. In his eyes and in the government's eyes, yes, but in in reality, God was in charge. I'll get to it. Hang on. Don't get ahead of me. (laughs) So... Verse 31, Pilate says, Take him and judge him by your own law. And the Jews say it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. You have to go back to John 12 to see where he did that. In John 12, Jesus says in verses 27 through 33, he says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. God, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. And others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And verse 32 is what I want you to land on specifically. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Jesus knew going into this exactly how it was going to play out. And it's why the Romans were involved, because he had to be lifted up. He had to be placed on a cross. If he had not been placed on a cross, he would have been a liar. God would have been a liar because it talks about in the Old Testament, specifically in Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23, that if you hang a man on a tree, he will be hanged and is cursed by God. Now, Jesus knew what was going on, and God knew what was going on, but the Jews didn't know what was going on, and Pilate didn't know what was going on, even though they were part of it. Yes, the Jews had culpability in Jesus' death. Yes, the Roman government, and specifically Pilate, had culpability in Jesus' death. But ultimately, ultimately, Jesus' dying on the cross was God's doing. And Jesus knew that, God knew that, God knew that from the very beginning of time. Now, I call this message reading from the blueprints, because that's what I want you to walk away with today, is this idea of God and Jesus were present together when the world was spoken into being. In Genesis 1-1, they're there together, okay? If you go back to John 1-1, you see Jesus referred to as the Logos, the Word, and it says in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, Jesus is God, and Jesus was present with Father when the world was, was breathed into life, life was breathed into it, and the world came into being. And they had a plan from that moment on that was going to lead to this point in time where Jesus is going to be crucified on the cross. Now, I've told you before that I had wrong theology when I was growing up. I thought at one period in my life, just because of how the Bible is laid out, that the law and the Old Testament was God's plan A, and that Jesus was God's plan B. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. The Old Testament, every part of it points to Jesus and what he's going to accomplish on the cross. It was not only plan A for Jesus to die on the cross, it was the only plan that there ever was. And he and the Father hatched that plan together before he ever breathed life into Adam and Eve. Now, if you go all the way into the end of John, because he is the literary author and he kind of moves things around a little bit, John actually puts the purpose of his gospel all the way in verse 31 of chapter 20, almost at the end of his entire book, where he says, but these things, all of this that he's written, is so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in him. That's the purpose behind what God wants to do here. 
That's the purpose of what John was trying to convey in the totality of his text. And it's because of this that Jesus has to die. Because the father's in charge. The architect of the plan is completely in charge. Let's go on. Let's look at verses 33 through 38. I'm going to leave 39 and 40 for Don in a couple of weeks. But 33, so Pilate entered his headquarters again. He goes back inside. He calls Jesus to himself and he said, are you the king of the Jews? Now, he obviously did not come up with this on his own. He, this is the, the, one of the accusation that was, accusations that was leveled against Jesus. So Jesus answered in a question again. Do you say of this of your own accord or did others say it about, to me about you, to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. Now you have to realize this comes right on the tail of them being in the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter pulling out his sword and lopping off the ear of Malchus. And Jesus healing Malchus and saying, no, that's not Peter, I understand. Peter, you, you're trying to get ahead of me a little bit here, but that's not what we're going to do. That's not how my kingdom is going to be played out. It's going to be played out the way the architect designed it and the way that he's given me that. So Pilate says in verse 37, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born. This is why I came here. And for this purpose, I've come into the world. This is why I'm man. This is why I'm the God-man. To bear witness to the truth. And he drops that word truth in front of Pilate. Everyone who listens to the truth listens to my voice. Why? What does John 14, 6 say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Pilate said to him in the video, What is truth? And then he goes back outside. Now you have to understand that not only is God the architect of all of this and has had this plan from the beginning of time, he was laying out the plan all through the Old Testament. We have to take the opportunity at times when we're in the midst of the things going on in our lives, to zoom out. Because when we're lost in the middle of what we're doing, when we're lost in the middle of the death of a spouse, when we're lost in the middle of the difficulties of caring for a loved one who's ill or dying, when we're lost in the middle of a cancer diagnosis, we have to... take the opportunity to zoom out and see what God is up to. And that's what I want us to pay attention to tonight. If you look at some of the places that talk about God's sovereignty in the Bible, sovereignty is a word that we use to to describe one of the attributes of God. And if you look it up in the dictionary, it talks about ultimate power and ultimate authority. But God has a different view of that because of who he is. In Matthew 26, 67, and 68, it's, um, sorry, in uh, Colossians 1.16, it says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. God's in charge of everything. God's in charge of everything that happens in your life. I'm letting that land a little bit. Because when you're faced with a cancer diagnosis, let's back up a step. When you're faced with the, a, a being T-boned in a car as you exit onto Tiedemann Road from Chipotle, which our pastor was a year and a half ago, you wonder, is God in this? And then when you go to the hospital and you get a CAT scan and a car accident turns into a cancer diagnosis and they say, you have cancer on your liver you tend to zoom in to your circumstances and you zoom in a little farther and you're lost in the middle of all of this. 
And God wants us to zoom out. He wants us to see what he's doing in the bigger context of things because he's the architect, he's in charge, and he can be trusted. Now, in Don's particular circumstance, he went from happy-go-lucky, right? You were just at Chipotle or were you at Starbucks? Panera, okay. And he, he goes through an intersection and a woman comes and T-bones him and car spins around, the airbags go off and all of a sudden he zooms in a little bit and he thinks, where is God in this? Thoughts probably flooded your mind like they would me. Is she insured? You know? Is my insurance going to cover this? Or am I going to have financial difficulties because of this? All of these things. And you zoom in a little bit. And then they say, hey, we want you to go to the hospital. And they give you a cancer diagnosis. I know what that feels like. I know that zoom in right there. It's almost like when you hear that word or you hear that diagnosis, the blood kind of drains out of your body. And you get cold. Because it happened in my wife's life. She was taken from a... a physical therapy appointment to the emergency room because they noticed some neurological things going on with her. And when I get there, an hour later, I walk into the room and one of the first things she says to me is, they found a tumor on my spine. And tumor usually means cancer. And, not, and I did. I just felt the blood drain out of my body and I felt this cold wrap around me. And I thought, can God be in this? Now, in Don's case, this cancer diagnosis, they do surgery months later, and they come out of the surgery in a very short period of time based on what they were supposed to do that day, only a couple hours in, and they say, well, we don't know what it was, but it wasn't cancer. And that's a situation that'll cause you to zoom out and go, God, you had this under control all along, and you had a plan for this, because you wanted Jeff to tell the story, and you wanted to be able to tell this story to people, to bring God glory. Let's look at some other opportunities where God talks about his sovereignty. In Jeremiah 32, 17, it says, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Cancer is not too hard for God. The death of your family member is not too hard for God. God allows this stuff to happen for his glory. And I know that's hard to hear when I'm talking about the death of a loved one. For his glory and for your good. Because he has a plan. He has a big plan. He has a plan that's bigger than just you. And he is the architect and he can be trusted. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Inscrutable means I can't challenge that. I want to challenge that. My initial reaction to the doctor saying, or to my wife telling me what the doctor had said, that she had a tumor on her spine, was, God, what are you up to? This can't be you. Bad things happen to bad people, right? Guess what? They happen to good people too. Because God's got a bigger plan in mind. He is the architect. Psalm 24, 1 and 2 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And then the last verse I want to point you to is Romans eight twenty eight, And y'all probably know this or have this as your life verse, but don't take it out of context. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We love to dive into that verse and pluck out that part. All things work together for good. Period. End of sentence. Man, I love that. Everything's going to work out. God's, God's going to be in control. God's going to take care of everything. I'm never going to have any sickness and I'm going to be wealthy and I'm going to be just happy. Do you hear that in society today? Do you hear that in churches around America today? That's the, that's the basis of the prosperity gospel. You can be healthy, wealthy, and wise. You just need to have enough faith. 
And what happens when somebody doesn't end up healthy, wealthy, or wise? They're often told, well, you just didn't have enough faith. This is on you. And that will break people. That will shatter people. And they'll run far from God. But if you understand that God's in control, ultimately, and he has a plan for all of this, you can trust him, and you can rest in him. Jesus' plan was to go to the cross. It was to go there and suffer what he needed to suffer for you and for me so that we could have relationship with God. Sin entered the world back in Genesis chapters 3, I believe. Sin enters the world and it's plagued us ever since. You know this. If you've had a child, you know as a one and a half year old or a two year old, you do not have to teach your child how to be selfish. Selfishness is inherent in us. Pride is inherent in us. And it's because of that original sin that we talk about in Christianity. And it had to be dealt with. And from the beginning of time, God and Jesus had a plan to deal with that sin. And that was the cross of Calvary. That's where we're headed. In two weeks, we're going to spend some time talking about fatherhood next week. In two weeks, we're going to get back into John 19 and 20, and we're going to go through the totality of this walk on the Via Dolorosa, this walk to Calvary, this walk up the hill of Golgotha, where Jesus gave everything for you and for me. As I was studying this week, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit, but I was struck by the thought of Jesus saying what he said on the cross. In Matthew 27, verse 46, he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the thought in my head was, if God's the architect, if Jesus is the architect with God, and he knew where he was going to be, when he gets to this moment, why does he cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If he knows the plan, and he knew the plan all along, and he was following the blueprint, why when he gets to this moment in time, does he say, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because there was a collision at that moment of God, of Jesus' deity and his humanity. And in his humanity, he was looking at the next few moments and days of being separated from God for the first time ever. In all of eternity, Jesus had not been separated from the Father. Yes, he left heaven and he came to earth as Emmanuel, God with us, but he was still in the presence of God. Jesus was often finding himself in prayer and crying out to God. But you saw a hint of it in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was crying and literally sweating drops of blood and he said, my father, if this cup, meaning if, if there's another way to accomplish this, let it pass from me, but not my will, yours be done. He's with the father even then. But at that moment on the cross when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The father could no longer look upon him because he could no longer look on the sin that was on Jesus that had been placed there, which is your sin and my sin, so that Jesus' righteousness could be imparted to you and I. And he knew in that moment that he was going to be separated from God for the first time ever. Now, this idea of a blueprint, I want to cover a little ground with you on this. Anybody ever been involved in a major building project, either a house or construction, Mark, many? You have to realize that when they finally get to the point of putting shovel in ground and digging, 
A ton of work has been done prior to that. Blueprints have been drawn up. Permits have been purchased. A plan is in place. This became very real and very apparent to me in 2009. Cuyahoga Valley Church went through a building project. They went through a campaign called Momentum where they determined that they were going to expand the worship center. The worship center at that time was a gymnasium. Rectangular box, even had the goalposts that cranked down from the ceiling because at one time they played basketball in there. If you look, you can still see in Cuyahoga Valley Church the carpet still looks like a basketball floor. It has the circles in the center circle. Mark's cleaned it many, many times. <laughs> many times. But at that time, they decided they were going to do away with some offices and a bathroom up on the, uh, the left side, if I'm standing in the back of the worship center looking at the stage. And they were going to do away with a youth room that existed over here on the right side. And they were going to push it back and they were going to create seating, a balcony. And they were going to push back an office underneath and create some more seating. And they went from about 580 seats to about 830 seats when they did this. But in the process of doing this, they had a plan. They had drawn up the plans. They had brought out the blueprints. They knew where every outlet was going to go. They knew where every light fixture was going to go. They knew exactly how everything was going to route back to this new electrical box that they put in. They knew everything, and they had a plan. And then they put all the general contractor, a guy named Tim Aquat, had, had the plan in place. I'm going to bring these guys in, and they're going to do the electrical stuff. And then I'm going to bring these guys in for the plumbing, and they're going to take care of the plumbing stuff. And then eventually, I'm going to put drywall over it. And these things have to happen in order. And I was caught in the middle of it because I was not part of the plans. I was the guy who wanted Ethernet and video cables pulled into outlets so we could hang TVs in the balcony and do other things. And so I would get calls at 6 o'clock in the morning from one of the managers of the work site going, if you're not here in the next 45 minutes, you're not going to have what you want because we're putting up drywall. And it had to happen in that order. If you, were built, if you were in the middle of a construction project and you let the drywallers go in and put up the drywall and then realize, wow, we needed an electrical box there, then you've got to tear that out and then they have to come back in. And then you realize, oh, well, we really needed a bathroom here, so you have to tear that out, and the drywallers have to come back in and do it again. So you do things in order, and you do it according to the plan. And that's what Jesus and God were doing. That's what, Jesus, that's what God was doing in the entire Old Testament. When he was whispering in the ear of Isaiah, when he was whispering in the ear of David, writing the Psalms, going, pen this, pen this about what's going to happen. They could write it with complete assurance because God was the one who was in charge and he was the one that was laying out the plan. And all of it was going to come true. Jesus was going to fulfill every one of the prophecies about him in the Old Testament without missing a mark because God was in charge. And Jesus had this assurance in his mind that he could follow this road because God had the plan and God was in charge. It says in Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Written hundreds of years before Jesus cried out those words on the cross. Because God was in charge. Now where do I want to take you with this today? I want to go back to how I prayed at the beginning of the service. I know some of your stories. I know what you're dealing with. I know William is caring for his mom in her latter years. I know what Kathy's been through with the death of her sister. I know what Don and I are going through. I know what Jim and Jean are going through. I know what Roy and, and Tom are going through. I know what Richie's been through. I know what Louise is going through right now. But I don't know all of your stories. Somebody came to me Friday night at the end of the service and told me that they lost a neighbor and a friend just in the past few days. Died at the age of 33. And no 
idea of whether they knew Christ. Guess what? We have the best news ever to share with the world. Gospel means good news. It's not just good news. It is the best news ever. And that news is that there's an architect and he's in charge and you can trust him. There's a competing view of what God is like and if you carry this view, I would ask you to change it. It's called the vivisectionist view of God. And what it is, is it's a view of God that he's a great experimenter. He's wearing a lab coat and he's up in heaven and he's got the world laid out in front of him in this big maze and he's moving pieces and parts around and he's just kind of messing with us the whole time. Let's see if they'll do this. We'll push them down this avenue and see what they do with it. Now there's some truth to that, but there's the heart behind it is missing because that's not how God treats us. Yes, God is moving pieces and parts to make things happen. He had to do things in order to make these things happen. I point to my own personal life. My wife and I probably met at least six times before we ever met. Now, what do I mean by that? I was traveling with a Christian recording artist for six years. She was friends with the guy who I worked with, who was the, the musical director for this Christian recording artist. And Riss came to several of the concerts. And we were introduced. We sort of remember probably shaking hands, but we don't really remember it because it wasn't the right time for us. It took God taking her from... Marion, Indiana, and bringing her to Cleveland. And it took God bringing me from Nashville, Tennessee, and bringing me to Cleveland. And it took bringing our mutual friend and bringing him here and placing him between us. Those were the things God was, pieces and parts God was moving around so that God could prepare primarily me to be the kind of husband and friend that my wife needed. So he's not the vivisectionist. He's not malicious in what he's doing, but he is very much in control of everything. He's very much in control of your circumstances right in the middle of a death of a spouse or a wayward child or a cancer diagnosis. And he can be trusted. That's the news we need to share. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, there is nothing that should prevent you from sharing that great news. And I say that with, with conviction because there have been times in my life where I was seated in a coffee shop and I felt my pulse begin to quicken and God was speaking in my ear asking me to talk to somebody. I could see in their face what they were going through. And all I had to do was ask, are you okay? Can I pray for you? What's going on? But I thought to myself, that's not God. Or, I don't want to disturb them right now. They're busy with their coffee. Or, I don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. I have done that. And I have missed the opportunity to share the best news ever with somebody. God will accomplish it. Okay? If God is after somebody, and he had prompted my heart for that person... God will achieve his goal in getting the gospel to that person. If I say no, God will find another way. And he has somebody waiting in line right behind me to speak truth to that person. But I, if I say yes, get the opportunity to participate in what it is that God's doing. That's what we need to do as believers. Now, if you're not a believer, if you don't know Christ and none of this makes any sense, and you're stuck in the middle of my children don't talk to me, or my daughter is chasing hard after the world, or my dad took his own life. If you're not a believer and that's what you're up against, then none of this makes any sense. 
and you're not sure you can trust the architect. Today may be the day of your salvation. Today may be the day to say, I cannot do this on my own. Anybody my age or older remember a TV series that was on television and on ABC in the late 1970s called Soap? Okay. Soap met with a ton of controversy when it came out. In fact, there were several stations that refused to show it because it dealt with, it, it, was, a, it was a parody of soap operas. It was a half hour long. It was serialized, so it went on and on. And it dealt with so many different things. There was a character who was abducted by aliens and then his wife had an alien baby and there was a, a girl who basically seduced a priest and they had a child together and that child was, uh, was possessed by the devil. I mean, there was just all kinds of stuff. There was a gay character and everybody was just w really leery of this TV show. People on the, on the right were very much afraid of the show the moral majority came out and spoke out against us. The Southern Baptist came out and spoke out against it. Gay rights activists came out and spoke out against it because they didn't, sh they didn't know how the gay character was going to be portrayed. It was offensive to everyone. But in the midst of it, there are little drops of truth. I was watching an episode recently, and the character whose wife is going to have an alien baby he finds out because he goes to the doctor and the doctor brings him in by himself and says, your wife's going to have a baby. They don't know it's alien yet. He's so excited. He's so happy that he's going to have a child. It's his first child with her. He has two sons by a previous marriage. He's so excited about that. But the doctor says, that's not all. The doctor says, you have five months to live. You have Mylar syndrome and it's incurable. And his response to the doctor is, okay, everybody else gets six. Why do I only get five? Which is a joke. But then when he's got a moment by himself a little bit later in that episode, he's sitting and he's thinking about what has been placed before him. He's zoomed all the way in on this situation. And he's thinking about it. And he never references God, but he looks upward and he says, I know you've got this under control and I know you can do whatever you want to do. I just ask that you would do it quickly. And that's crazy to hear that coming out of a character in a show that is just widely offensive to everyone. But he recognized in that moment, he zoomed out and saw that God had a plan. I haven't watched the rest of the episodes. I don't know exactly what happens. I know he doesn't die, but, and he does have an alien baby. But, but if a TV show that's universally offensive can get, it, get that right, then we need to be confident that we have the best news ever to share. So we need to go do that. Bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're a believer and you're caught, zoomed in on something, I want you to recognize God in that situation. I want you to zoom out and I want you to see what it is that he's trying to accomplish because he will do things that you think are not of him but they are for his glory and for your good. So say to the Lord, Father, wherever I'm at, what, what, what I'm going through, and name it to him right now. In the midst of this, Father, I choose to zoom out and I would ask you to show me what it is that you want to accomplish in this, in me through this. What you want to accomplish through, if there's somebody else involved, if it's your child or your spouse, what you want to accomplish in and through them in this. I, help me to zoom out and see, Lord, what it is that you're doing to bring yourself glory 
and to bring me good. Now the next step would be to say, if you're a believer and you're not in the middle of something, guess what? You're headed that way. This is not your best life now. This is not health and wealth and wisdom and happiness. This life has difficulties because sin exists. And God will take those things that were meant for evil and he will make them for his glory and for your good. So be ready when you get there to be ready to be zoomed out right away and see it before you ever go into it. And say to the Lord, prepare me, Lord, for what it is that you have planned for my life. I give you everything. I trust you completely because you are the architect. You're following the plan, and I know that you can be trusted. You are sovereign. If you're not a believer, if you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, today is the day of your salvation. You can know with certainty that Jesus, from the beginning of time, was going to die on a cross for you, for your sin, for your forgiveness, so that you could be set free from the penalty of sin so that you could be set free from your sin, so that you could be set free to bring glory and honor to God and for your good. All it takes is for you to recognize that you are at the bottom of yourself, that you have reached the bottom and there's nothing else you can do. You've tried everything. You've tried to dull the pain with alcohol. You've tried to dull the pain with drugs. You've tried to dull the pain with sex, you've tried to dull the pain with wealth or fame or even religion, and none of it, none of it fixes the hole that's in you, because God made that hole in you, and he made it so that only he could fill it. So turn to him right now, there are no magic words, but turn to him and say, Father, I am at the end of myself, I cannot do this, I need you. I trust that you did and that you followed the perfect plan from the beginning of time to die on the cross for my sin, to be raised again, to impart your righteousness on me for the sin that was in my life. You did that for me and I trust you and I will move forward from this day on walking away from my sin and walking toward you knowing you can be fully trusted because you are the architect. If you said that to the Lord today for the first time ever, you need to find Dawn or myself or one of the other leaders, somebody on the worship team, and you need to tell them, I gave my heart to Christ today. I turn from my sins and I turn toward the Savior of my life, the Lord of my life, and I will make him Lord and I can trust him because he is the architect. We'll guide you in the next steps. We'll get you ready for classes in September and we'll take you through basic discipleship, how to know more about what it is that God has, the plan that he has for your life to bring you good and him much honor and glory so that all men can be drawn to him. Father, we love you. We commit our lives to you today. We're so grateful that you're in charge. We're so grateful that you have a plan, that you're following that plan. You cannot be diverted from that plan and that you allow us to be a part of it, Lord. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you stand with us for our last song?
Pastor Don's going to be in the back. Be seated for just a second. One of the things I did not touch on tonight, but I wanted to include it, is if God is completely in charge, somebody is going with an antagonistic spirit is going to ask you, well, then did God create evil? If he's completely in charge, did God create evil? Okay, and I didn't want to deal with that today, but I do want to let you know that about 15 minutes ago, we posted on Facebook a video link, and you can go watch a, a, an author by the name of Kay Arthur, and she deals with this topic in the, in the context of God's sovereignty. She, she delves into the question of, did God create evil? And I want you to go watch that on our Facebook page. So I want us to pray together. This world is getting darker. Do you realize that? Do you not recognize that in situations like Uvalde? and Tulsa, and Ames, and Buffalo, the things that are going on in this world. The enemy is clamoring for ground because he knows the end is near, the enemy being the devil, and he is looking for ways to gain some sort of a victory. And the world's growing darker and darker, but light pierces darkness. Like when you walk into a room and it's completely dark, you close the door behind you and you flick on a light, the darkness just runs. It just evaporates out of the room. The idea here is that the church is God's light in this world. And God wants us to shine brighter and brighter as the world goes darker and darker. And that's our challenge in the midst of the darkness that we see is be light. Be light to that person in Starbucks that you see the pain in their face and ask the question, are you okay? Can I pray for you? What's going on? Don't run from that situation. Be the light. Pastor Don will be in the back if you want to talk with him. I'm going to pray and then we'll dismiss. Father, 
thank you for today. Thank you for the reminder, Lord, that you are in charge. Father, thank you for the reminder that we are the church. We are the ecclesia. We're the called out ones that are called to be light in this dark and ever more dark world. Father, we pray that you would knit our hearts together as a body, that we would stand together, that the world would look on and go, there's something going on there. It's not what I see everywhere else in the world. They respond differently. They love each other and they love me. And I want to be a part of that. So Father, make that true of us. Make that true of me, Lord. Don't let me stiff arm you, Lord, when you nudge my heart to talk to someone. To share the best news ever with them. And that they can trust you. Thank you, Lord, for being the architect. Thank you for the plan that you have. And thank you for involving me. Thank you for involving us in that plan. We love you, Lord. We commit our lives to you. And we look forward to what it is that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Mama's Bible study tomorrow night at 6.30. CR is Tuesday. Dinner at 6. The program at 7. We'll be back together Friday night at 7 o'clock with dinner at 6. And don't forget, invite somebody. We've got worship and a movie starting at 5 o'clock next Saturday. And this movie's powerful. It's about fatherhood. And it covers the whole gamut. I understand that fatherhood means something very different for everybody. It can mean great pain. It can bring great joy. But it's something worth your time. So please join us next Saturday night. Love you all. We'll see you.